Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. My name is Valerie Ling. I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm the founder of the Effective Businesses. Essentially, we're in the leadership and well-being space. I lead a team of globally serving psychologists who empower high-performing individuals to do their best work and not burn out. To the point, I was actually invited to talk about the issue on BBC World last year. So I'm all about seeing a world without burnout and making sure that high-performing leaders lead the way in that respect. I caught that BBC interview. That was great. (laughs) Yes. It was my moment of fame, I think. Will it ever (laughs) return? I have no idea. But, you know, I'm kind of milking it right now. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm sure it will. I'm Justin Zeng. I'm a marketer and the CEO of Advendo.ai, the Coco Samoa and Mighty Metas. It's a Web3 project. For the past 35 years, I've been delivering marketing strategies to tech-friendly businesses. My background is in marketing and advertising. I've been fortunate enough to win tech work and also for my agency. I'm the author of The Modern Marketing Guide for Entrepreneurs, and I speak at conferences, including MarTech, CX, Symposium, and more. I do media interviews and contribute quotes. And I, my kind of quirky blend is I bring creative director slash design thinker, business operator and tech geek skills to the table. (laughs) So in a sense, how I operate is like a fractional CMO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am. I'm proud to say that I have a track record of doubling and tripling small business revenue. No small claim, Justin. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I joke to my clients, to some of my clients, I say, you know, the reason why I have this track record is because I'm like a good lawyer. If I don't think I can win, I won't take the job. (laughs) 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 You know, so Valerie, Tech Geek is really interesting. I was actually pleasantly amused when one of my colleagues actually called me a tech geek. Now, I'm a psychologist, so to me, this is actually fascinating that I've been identified as being someone who views technology as being essential in the way that we live life and do business. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that it just creeps into your life. And I suppose it depends on how willing you are to use technology. I mean, at first, I suppose sometimes it feels like it's a crutch. Am I letting go of skills that I should be mastering? But, you know, I think if anyone's grown a business beyond themselves, they start to feel like I need to leverage as much as I can, be a team or technology. Yep. And that's what we're talking about today. Yep. Absolutely. Team and technology. Spot on. That should have been the title of this space, I think. It's catchier, isn't it? (laughs) It is. (laughs) If only we had an award-winning marketer on the call. (laughs) (laughs) And which psychologist doesn't actually think of people first? (laughs) You know what? Speaking speaking of award-winning marketers, Suzanne Shockman is actually on here. This is an award-winning marketer. So glad you could join us, Suzanne, and I know you're listening. Val, I had a very interesting conversation today with my PA. So yeah. we were talking about how we can better improve some of our back-end processes, right? So what's interesting yeah. is at first we started by saying here that can follow us to each of the meetings, transfer those notes to Asana, our project management tool, impeccably. Right. Yep. And then we were considering the, the kind of qualifications, the kind of, you know, is it junior, midweight, senior, etc. Will they be good at details? How will we align time zones with clients as well as ourselves and with them and availabilities? And then this idea struck me, wait a minute, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft recently bought into chat GPT and yes. apparently they brought chat GPT into Teams. Yes. So all we really need to do is host a host our calls on Teams and ChatGPT will automatically do everything I just said. Yes. So that's isn't that that's that's just a mind blowing example of how you could be thinking one way, which is right now actually outdated and take a gamble on, let's say, ChatGPT and use it in a real life application. 
Yeah, I think I've been reflecting on the responses that I have from peers and people who talk to me about AI. So you, as you know, I'm a psychologist. And so I'm all about trying to increase what I call help-seeking behavior in leaders because one of the reasons why high-performing leaders burn out is one part, they're ashamed to ask for help, but another part, they're just not really practiced at asking for help. And I was thinking that the other personality that's really important in, in making this work is an openness to experience. Like the more you let go of what, you think is normal and the way it has been done and you actually allow your mind to just go we'll do it this way or let's explore this way what if we did it this way the more we see those opportunities i'll give you an example this morning right Mm -hmm. I've now created a discipline for myself that aside from all of the other tabs that I use for productivity and managing my businesses I always have chat gpt open I call it chappy now, yep. I got an SMS message today from someone whom I confess, I had no idea who it was. Who <laughs> said, you know, like, hey, so excited to talk today. Thanks for the reaching out. I'm looking forward to our call. When would be a good time to call? And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> who is this? You know, which of my 50 bazillion appointments yeah. that do I have? And the yeah. old brain went, oh, crap. Let me go through my email. You know, I was going to stroll, scroll through all my emails, all of my SMSs. All of... The new brain says, pause. What haven't you explored with how Chappy or ChatGPT can cut down minutes and cognitive resources and, frankly, emotional turmoil to respond to this? So I asked ChatGPT, hey, I've got yeah. this SMS. I'm really embarrassed. I need it to not sound like I don't actually know who they are. But, you know, write me an SMS message. Done. Yeah. The message went out. I got the response. Sorry, wrong number. <laughs> Imagine, Justin, if I had spent all that time, <laughs> like, yeah. I probably needed a second coffee to think, oh, my gosh, how could I have not remembered? What kind of a leader am I? What kind of business am I running? All of yeah. that saved because I wrote back, you know, one sentence. Done. Uh-huh. It's, it's just openness to experience. It's going... How can this actually change the way that I do things and help me? And to what, on a scale of one to 10, reflecting on how, how you relied on ChatGPT instead of, let's say, your intuition or your, yeah. you know, deep experience yeah. as a business owner and professional, how much did that scare you on a scale of one to 10? Scare me on a scale of one to 10? Yeah. Um, to be very frank, if 10 is terrified, I would say that one, but I have to have a mental discipline, Justin, to take calculated risks in business, right? So I feel like with chat GPT, I've had to discipline myself to not be scared of it. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I do know what you mean. Um, I'm in kind of two minds about this. And on the one hand, as you know, as a thinker, as approaching it philosophically, I feel like if you're not, and this isn't, this isn't, I'm in the same bucket as you. I'm not scared by Chat GPT, but let me just explain one side of my view: is that if you don't, if you're not scared by AI, yeah. you don't understand AI. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's but fascinating. It, but what we're talking about is are we scared of the application of AI? So I would give myself probably a four, and here's why. Yeah. The fear doesn't come from ChatGPT is going to take over my world and my business and become Skynet. Yeah. The, the scary thing for me is how much of my thinking process yeah. am I willing to let go? So I noticed something in my behavior, and I don't know if it's a guy thing or maybe it's just a me thing. But after marriage, my my wife, Lassie, is so good at giving directions. It's her superpower that I kind of just deferred to her when we're going somewhere. She's even To, to me, she's even better than Google Maps because Google Maps takes you on the main, the main roads, whereas Lassie will take me into side streets. And it's like magic. I didn't, it's, it's like entering into a portal and coming out somewhere else and going, I didn't even know you could do that. Mm. Um, I didn't even know there was a road there. And 
it got to such the point that I was so comfortable trusting her that mm. I even do it in car parks. It's very embarrassing to say publicly, but I even do it in, in car parks <laughs> to the point where I'm like, I don't think I can get out of this car park without you helping me. <laughs> so, and this is, this is a reliance that I think, you know, any CEO or C-suite person can relate to. They become mm. so specialized at what they do mm. with the people helping them do everything else that we almost become a little dysfunctional in everyday life if we didn't have the team around us. Now, here's the part that scares me. Because ChatGPT is so accessible and so quick, how much am I willing to let go so that it can just do it for me? And philosophically speaking, I think therefore I am. So am I if I stop thinking? <laughs> 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 okay, we've gone into some deep waters here, it, you know, but it's related to how we, we thought about this conversation because you and I um, really struggle to get personal assistance. Isn't that interesting? So yeah. it, it, we, we were already struggling with the issue of how do I actually give off the things that occupy my brain and my hands to someone else? And do you know what the answer for me is? But we don't give away our heart. So let me unpack that for you. Uh, I have full confidence because of the way our brains work that the pathways in your brain for how to get out of a car park and how to drive are already there. Now, they may get some dusty cobwebs because you've been relying on your wife, but it won't hmm. take you too long to reenact that pathway if you had to, if you really had to, right? So, Like riding a bike. Yeah. Can I send an SMS to someone who got the wrong number? 100%. You know, if, yeah. if I was doing that every day as a part of my focus and sending hundreds of these SMSs back, I would get more practice to it. But here's the thing. That's not where my heart is. So for me, the things that I can give away, whether it's to a personal assistant or to chat GPT that occupy my mind and my hands, I would much rather do because then I'm fully focused on what my heart and only I can engage in to do. So, for example, for you, you may not, you know, you may rely on Lassie to get out of the car park, but now you've got resources to think about what will delight the family for where you're going. What are you going to exactly. eat? Exactly. Um, you know, who yeah. are you going to meet? You know, you can tap into that, right? And Mike McCullowitz talks about this in his book, Clockwork. We as operators have four functions that we typically do, and it's, it's the doing, the delegating, the deciding, and then the designing. And ideally, we want to move towards more of the designing time and yes. off the doing, even off the delegating and deciding time. Yeah, 100%. So you, you brought up an interesting topic. You've said two things now. You've said heart and you've said brain. And it's really fascinating. I've been talking about AI with you know, C-suites and corporations around the world. Yeah. And what I always find is that we cannot escape talking about the human impact and the philosophical impact behind AI. I really can't think of another technology that I've spoken about with them, be it automation or Google mm. Ads or Facebook, where it gets so deeply philosophical and personal. Yeah. One way that the head of marketing for ANZ said to me, she thinks about it as, is big brain and little brain. Yeah. She said, you have in any data set or technology, you have the big brain and the little brain. The yeah. big brain is the huge data set and the little brain is the agile thinking about what to do with it and what to do and how to apply it. Yeah. To me, I wonder whether, so fundamentally, I don't think that AI replaces human beings. Okay. Mm. Um, I think it frees you up to do more human things personally. Mm. The question then becomes, which one are we? Are we big brain or are we little brain? Yeah. And this is the first time in human history that I think it gives us pause to mm. say, well, maybe I'm not big brain because I don't have the data set of the AI. I can't make the connections that it can. And mm. I just don't have the inputs. AI has all of human history that whatever is recorded within text be on the internet. It has that entire data set. Plus, it has our contextual 
cultural cues from the way we communicate in, say, a WhatsApp or Facebook, or and all of that data is available to mm. various AI companies. It's really interesting that this is the first time that we might have to say, perhaps I'm little brain. Before it was human plus AI. And I have a feeling that it's more and more, at least in the business context, going to become AI plus human. Well, so so this is for me where I think the heart issue comes in. So at a personal level, I know that I have to do the hard work on thinking ethically and thinking about in my personal life and with my family and my kids, you know, what does it mean for us to actually continue to maintain a high level of creativity and deep thought, right? So you mentioned a book that you've been reading. I've been plowing my way through a very difficult book, the Kahneman book on Think Fast, Think Slow. And, mm. and I think the more we have technology, and, and this is not new, right? So AI has been around for a while. You know, a lot of us talk about how the printing press came in and that disrupted the way that we do things. You know, you look at the publishing world and the self-publishing. It's not new for technology to ramp up the ability to produce, but it's really important as a human being, we still take the spaces to think and reflect. And like you said, engage the big brain. My thinking is that many of the things that occupied, you know, the, the big brain can now be pushed to a small brain because there is there are some things that are so rehearsed that are just set in stone in terms of a, of a, a normative law. Do you know what I mean? Like, is it yeah. okay for us to go on the internet? Like, I'm a student now. And we were talking about how, you know, in the old days, your research supervisors would say, you don't look at the meta reviews, like that's lazy, Right. Now, everybody mm. starts with the meta reviews <laughs> because the, yeah. the quality of all of the research that's gone into the big engines has also improved. So, you know, there's yeah. a degree of things now that, that can produce good things because many of the deep th thought processes have been auto automated and aggregated. Do you know what I mean? For me, it goes back to the question of, so therefore, what makes us human they're the things that we actually need to take time and reflect and slow down before we move. So as an example, am I going to use chat GPT to write, you know, letters to like emails to my kids? Well, I'd have to stop and reflect and pause and think and connect with my values <laughs> and think about my heart. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Those things I think are the things that separate us out from just being mindless users to thoughtful users, and I guess I would argue, and therefore, first adopters or influencers or thought leaders in the space, we need that, right? That's right. And, and I think that's as well where we have struggled finding great personal assistance, Val, because on the one hand, you don't just want the hands, you want the heart. Yeah. It's easy to delegate the hands, but then if they don't have the heart, you're actually just finding yeah. tasks to hand over and they're taking yeah. orders and off they go and do it. But a great personal assistant understands the human's aspect of it, that you yeah. may not ask for something that you need or, you know, you're forgetful or they can see that, you know, there's an issue coming up that you maybe haven't perceived. And with the emphasis on the word personal, they can connect dots between your business and personal life that you, you are not seeing. That's right. I, would, I do wonder whether AI will get to that space. I do know that I've been having conversations with um, Jason Mars in Silicon Valley who designed the the AI Giseki and Clink. So Jason was saying that he had some interesting comments on ChatGPT. In fact, I should actually get him on, on one of our spaces. One of the things that he said was, firstly, it's not scalable because it requires an army of humans to train behind the scenes. All you see is the magical output, but it's actually a lot of human training behind the scenes. Mm. But he, the other interesting thing that Jason is doing is he's designing a personal assistant that's based on AI. That is, that ah, is AI. I think that's it's, called, it's called Maya. Yeah. yeah and yeah. The, the chief aim of it is for it to be able to predict what you're going to need. Mm. It'll, it'll notice your patterns, notice the things that you put down in your journal and your thoughts and things like that and predict what you're going to need next. Val, what do you think about... What do you think about this chat GPT, not just as personal assistant, but did you know that you can tell it to 
be a business coach? Do you know that you can guide it by saying, <laughs> imagine you're a business coach or yeah. even imagine you're my PA and this is yeah. my problems. What would you advise that I work on? Have you ever tried doing that? Now, you see, that is that interesting. If you ask me to rate that on a scale of one to 10 into a fear factor, my fear factor just went up. Okay, so what's the difference between using it to send an SMS versus using it as a business coach? So fundamentally, uh, for me, who is leading me, right? So even, let's go back to personal assistance and chat GPT. The motivation yeah. for me actually to introduce chat GPT to my personal assistant and even eventually to my team was a high belief that leaders impact, influence, and shape right? I don't want my team to be left behind. I want them to start thinking and using and refining because otherwise, you know, they're, they're, they're just going to have a fear factor. So for me, introducing chat GPT into the business is one part for productivity, but on the other part is as a leadership function to say, guys, your kids are going to be dealing with this. You need to get to know this, right? So to me, it's still a lead function. I'm sitting at the top going, what is it that's going to impact, improve, and influence uh, my team and therefore the, the types of things that we do? It's quite the other thing for me to surrender myself to being led. So, yeah, okay, if I were to feed it through and say, you know, give me five things that a business coach would say to me, I would want to receive that with a high level of discernment. And I think people who could contextualize that for me, if that makes sense. I don't want to be yeah, it, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that makes sense. Um, uh, for some reason, I look at it as if ChatGPT has all access to all of the business books that have been written and all of the publications that in the knowledge era that we've just come out of, yeah, let's say the sure. last 10, 15 years, business yeah. coaches publishing content, trying yeah. to get themselves on SEO, ranking first on Google. All of their thinking is out there. And really, from my own experience, coaching businesses you are repeating yourself a lot of the time so it's actually it's like a it's like a sounding board they say yes. you know advice is the thing you ask for when you already know what to do but wish you didn't yeah and i think ai chat gpt for example is so impartial that it could tell you exactly what you know you need to know and just point you in the right direction but there is so much nuance in business right so i don't think it can truly lead I suppose yet it would need an incredibly personal data set, which is a bit scary in itself. I have no doubt that it will be able to produce it. And here's the interesting thing. It will be too deep a conversation, I think, to say, you know, what, what makes it what makes it sentient. But for me, when I look at the leadership uh, readings that I do, for example, leaders don't have a problem synthesizing, synergizing information or knowledge. The thing that we lack and the reason why we burn out is to actually then have self-insight and awareness that's so deeply personal underneath the layers that we're not even aware of. So I tell my team all the time, Justin, I you know have a big thing about abandonment. It, it's a big trigger for me, huge trigger, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Now, as I'm going through daily things, like people, if people resign or if they move on or even you know, people not signing up for my webinars, I get deeper and deeper, deeper insight about how the trigger of abandonment is triggered in my leadership and in the way that I do things. I've avoided doing a whole bunch of things because of it. Can ChatGPT get to the bottom of that? Can it actually you know, connect the dots for me when I don't even know what the dots are? Um, is it able to go deep into that level of going, here is the awareness? I'm not there yet. I don't know if it will. And, and for that reason, I would be cautious about absorbing the output that it gives that is at the level that doesn't have insight and awareness. Exactly. Yeah. I, 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 I want to actually use this and, and hop back to something that we discussed earlier which is the human element that it, it brings out the humanness. Now, if we were in the age of knowledge previously, yep. what age are we in now? Mm. I think my personal belief, and this has been in my talk track and will continue to be more so, 
is that we are in the age of wisdom. Here's why. Because the onus was on us previously to have answers. And so Google came along and gave us knowledge. Now ChatGPT is imbuing expertise and democratizing expertise to every level of our yeah. be it junior, midweight, senior, and across the board. Yeah. Yeah. So do experts exist anymore? Because it's so easy for a non-expert, traditionally speaking, to go to ChatGPT and put in a few half-baked inputs and a zygote of an idea and come out sounding like an expert. Mm. And even demonstrating expertise. So if it's so easy to output knowledge, what then becomes the human trait that is valuable in the marketplace of tomorrow? I believe it's wisdom because I don't think it's about having the right answers anymore. It's about asking the right questions. So yeah. ChatGPT can only Love give that. you a level of, of answer to the yeah. level that you have formed your question. Yeah. And, and this goes back to, does it have insight and leadership and wisdom? It doesn't because it's still dependent on the level of the questions that it asks, that, that we ask it. Can it join links for you? Not unless you asked it to. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you don't know that you need to ask it to, you won't ask it. Exactly. Yeah. How have you seen this democratizing of expertise impact your business value? Well, I'm in the mental health space. So, you know, it's interesting, right? I, I actually did, I attended, I was a participant in a fairly complex modality for therapy over the weekend. And the trainer who, I don't know, is in a sort of late season of life said, you know, the age of talk therapy is coming to an end, um, referencing that, you know, we know so much about how people respond neurologically that we'll be able to treat their mental health issues that way. And the gasp in the room, oh, you know, <laughs> mm. what? That will never happen. You know, I think for me, that's the similar thing. The question that we're asking in the AI space, is it possible for us to actually, you know, help people in the deepest longings and sufferings and brokenness mm. through this platform? So I don't know that it's impacted us at the moment, apart from, you know, learning how to use it more for productivity and for, for marketing. Uh, but it will be something that we will have to, to, to grapple with. Will people, from a commercial perspective, prefer to use an AI-generated platform than see a psychologist? My gut would say no. There's a lot that we know about the human-to-human -human interaction that's still very powerful in the room. Can you integrate it with your therapy? I think you can. Right? Uh, absolutely. So in that context... In that context, the therapy is still big, therapist is still big brain and AI is still little 100%. Brain. You know, like, so we have, you know, let's say if you have uh, an anxiety to, for public speaking. So quite a lot of our executives, you know, as they go up the performance ranks and they have to do more presentations and, you know, rally the troops and things like that, a type of social anxiety comes up. Now, you can absolutely use AI to generate a bunch of exercises um, to help the person to, you know, gradually expose themselves to fear. Now, therapists sometimes can spend a lot of hours just trying to generate those sorts of things. But what AI can do is it takes the common human experience for what everybody else has been searching for <laughs> and deliver it to your doorstep. Done. Bam. Right. So I think it, and you're right. We still have to generate the ability to say, this is what we need. And even finesse it because what are you actually afraid of in the public speaking? For some people, it's the, the fear of the evaluation of the crowd. For some people, they're even more basic. It's just the thought that everybody can see, you know, see them, see through them. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you still have to feed it that insight. And I think, like you said, the wisdom that comes from just knowing human beings. So I think that's a pretty good summary of our discussion today. The, when it comes to personal assistance versus chat GPT or yeah. assistant or applications like chat GPT, a great personal assistant has the ability to intuit and to have the heart and the wisdom 
yeah. to ask the right questions and identify the needs. Yeah. That is still something that chat GPT can't do. Now, can it be the hands of the assistant? Absolutely. Yeah. Is there, are there any other final thoughts that you had or that want, you want to, to get across as we begin to wrap up? So I would say that the other new thing I'm discovering about having a personal assistant, so previously I'd had personal assistants that really just assisted me in my workspace. The big game changer for me has been actually having our personal assistant also help me with our personal lives. <laughs> mm. Emphasis just, on personal. Yeah, you know, like I can't make... Um, head or tail of how to fit this medical appointment, that car appointment, and this mm. school appointment in the midst of all the other work appointments. And one of the things that I've discovered in having this assistance, the great encouragement that my personal assistant gives me, you know, the reminder that actually you had a late night the other night or you know, mm. do you think that it would be better if you had your dinner? You, you know, it's, it's not that that's what's coming now, but I can see that as we interact more and more with one another, there is an intimacy that comes from just encouraging you and reminding you that, you know, you may not have thought about this or you may be pushing yourself a little bit too far or I think this is more important for you, am I right, right? Now, at mm. this point in time, until they build sensors for uh, AI that can scan my, my body responses, I'm sure that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to tell the chat GPT Neural to link. say, you know, yeah. encourage me right now. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that, that sounds like something that Neuralink might try to solve for being able to <laughs> make us better humans with in, inverted quotes. Yeah and read our, our markers to better assist us. But that's a topic all of its own. Valerie, it's been so great chatting to you today. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's been a blast. I do wonder whether we should delve a little bit deeper into some of the topics that you touched on today yeah. around burnout. I think I'd be very interested to have a discussion in future spaces around AI and how it can halt or, or worsen what many entrepreneurs are on the path to, which is burnout. Yeah, I'd love to. Have me back. Great. Let's chat again soon, Valerie. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for joining. We will share this on Twitter and be sure to share it out so that we can have more discussions and more comments and feedbacks to make these discussions even better next time. Thanks, Valerie. Cheers. See you later.